So, what are you going to ask me today? <laughs> I'm going to start off with obviously, I mean, just being myself and talking about why I'm, you know, I feel so honored to be here. And I'm into integrative medicine, so I handle like hundreds and hundreds of cancer patients and around the world. And before I met them, my success rate, when I say success rate, was probably, I was doing okay. When I added the meditation part, I completed the cycle. So I believe today I'm in a complete cycle. Of course, there's always scope for things to get better. But I'm realizing how I cannot treat the physical self without involving the emotional self and the heart. And that's what's made the difference. Mm -mm. And that's just not my way of seeing it. I mean, I have oncologists who obviously do the chemo for my patients. And they say, Luke, when your patients come, there's a vast difference in how they handle chemo compared to patients who you know, are not meditating, are not doing nutrition and putting things together. So I'm a firm believer that there's no magic pill. Meditation alone is not going to cure you. Nutrition mm -hmm. alone is not going to cure you. And of course, we know medicine alone is not going to cure you. So how do we take everything together in an integrative manner and mm -hmm. put it together? And although I'm into nutrition and integrative medicine, I'm seeing that the most powerful drug is the mind and the heart. Because you can put the best nutrition in someone's body, but if the mind or the heart's messed up, mm -hmm. it doesn't work. It doesn't absorb. You can't absorb nutrition if there's cortisol, which is a stress hormone in the body. Yeah, so first, yeah. we got to calm them, prepare them for nutrition. Like mm -hmm. a surgeon prepares you for surgery, mm -hmm. we got to prepare them for nutrition. And that's where mm -hmm. heartfulness has come in and, you know, fill that gap. And honestly, it's not just the tool of meditation that I've come across with heartfulness. It's the people around so it's like, you know, it's there. It's not just something because I am skeptical. I mean, when you're in medicine, you're skeptical about everything around you. Mm. You know, whether these are quick fixes, whether people are here to really change people or is it money making? And, you know, it's great that heartfulness is free and all of those things. But always I look to see, you know, how is it impacting the person, you know, at the end of it all. <clears throat> and today we have clients all over the world, like all over the world from Paris to you name it, and we managed to connect them with trainers, and I mean, it's changed They all their practice meditation now? They all practice meditation. There are some who are resistant, and I know that because we set up the appointment and they keep pushing it off. Mm. So we leave them. We leave them. And then it's my job and my team's job to counsel them that, you know, when the treatments are not going through well, we say, see, you're doing everything well. The missing path is this. Because I noticed if you force them, they, they develop not an aversion as such, but everyone has them, you know, their uh, perceptions towards meditation and most people think, especially the wealthy people, you know, I have like some of the wealthiest people in the world and I have right, people from villages. So I get to see the difference in their thinking. The wealthy people will first use their power and money to get the best treatments and best hospitals around the world. They'll do the full round, America, London, everything, and then they'll come back and they'll say, okay, you know, we need to change our path. And then they'll open up to meditation, they'll open up to nutrition, they'll open up to everything else. Mm -hmm. So our vision is, you know, why not do it together? Have a fancy mm -hmm. hospital, have a fancy doctor, but why not start the journey together? Because you cannot separate the mind and the body. It's impossible. I've seen mm -hmm. it happen. I was, I was shocked when I had yoga and Vipassana teachers come to me with cancer. Mm -hmm. And for me, it shook my faith in meditation a little bit because I would always look up to them and say, oh, you're meditating, which means, you know, you're healthy. And then I realized that you can be evolved in your emotional self, but you've neglected the physical self. Mm -hmm. And some people are evolved in the physical self, but they've neglected the emotional self. So it cannot work. Mm -hmm. That much I'm sure of. And then um, I read the book also, you know, that you've written, fantastic book. I, I, I mean, I've been told that you're a pharmacist who speaks about you highly besides everyone here is Pierre in Dubai. So he's become a close friend. So basically he keeps talking to me about, you know, how you were into, you know, pharmacies across the US. And I mean, we need medicines. It's as simple as that. But we also have to understand our body is, has its own pharmacy of its own. And it's got to be tapped out in terms of hormones and everything. Yeah. Once uh, we, I had a pharmacy interview. Okay. Some uh, general came up because of some patients recommended go interview this pharmacist. <coughs> I was practicing then in Brooklyn, New York. Oh, okay. And I spoke at length about meditation. Mm -hmm. And in the journal, they typed medication. Medication <laughs> is important. Medication is important. Medication is important. They spoiled my article. <laughs> so they just T to C. And what a change. They thought yeah. being a pharmacist, I'm only talking about medication. Right. 
<laughs> so, but it only shows how closely related these two terms are, medication mm. and meditation. Right. Yeah, but today I can use meditation as my medication for people if I, exactly. you know, because a lot of people look for quick fixes, you know, mm. after I tell them holistic, they, they love it. But mm. they say, but just write something, give me something which is like, you know, mm. they want that kind of medication because the mind believes it's going to give you a quick fix. It's, you know, what our mind has picked up over the years, mm. you know, through social media, through what people say. So there's a lot of layers that, you know, like in your book, you've mentioned, they have to come out one by one, mm. one by one. It's a long process, but someone has to start somewhere. So. So it's interesting. Medication, <clears throat> food, etc. Yeah. In our understanding, which has been passed on for thousands of years, <clears throat> they, they believe. And there is some sort of comfort also in believing this, that we have a physical body. Mm-hmm. Right? When I'm looking at things with my eyes, Right. Let's see, let's add one more element to it. Suppose if your eyes are compromised and you're wearing glasses, Mm -hmm. right? And when you are able to see better with glasses, are glasses enough? Even with the compromised eyesight, you still need that compromised eyesight, even when you want to wear the glasses. You still need this. And behind this thing, let's see, if if my vision center is damaged inside the brain, my, and there is something behind also, I may see something, but my mind interprets it the way it wants, the way it is trained. Right. Right? And it starts judging. Judging again plays another element into the picture. I see with some instruments, but instruments are useless if I don't have even a damaged eyesight. Mm. I need something at a physical level. <clears throat> if I had, if I can take care of it, still I need to take care of the inner eye that perceives the thing, the brain behind the eyesight, the mind behind the interpretation, intelligence behind its discrimination, right. and ego to make a decision, this is right or wrong. So, <clears throat> we have understood thus far physical body is, is a must. We must, when it is compromised, eyesight is poor. If I can fix my eyesight with medita- medications, drugs, uh, maybe you have glaucoma, maybe you have conjunctivitis, you, st- you, need, medi- medi- uh, you, need, you need prescription drugs. Okay. Right? But let us see, you have some altogether a different problem where you are seeing things and interpreting it differently because you have a mental problem. Hmm. Prejudiced mind. There is a beautiful story in, in one of these uh, Sufi stories. They're beautiful. They have beautiful parables. They come up with ordinary stories and, and they portray a beautiful outcome out of these parables. One of them is this, Zonaid, one of the greatest Sufi master. He had a king visiting him and he wanted to become his disciple. I want to become your disciple, you are so famous. So Zonaid goes on refusing him, said, no, you are not ready yet, you are not ready yet. But being a king, he forced his way to it. He, then Zonaid said, okay, let us wait one week. After one week, I will initiate you to my system. Junaid was a smart guy. He created a scenario. And um, he went across the river from his town and where his family was living there. Under one tree, he invited someone to come there. He sat there with her started having, you know, those, and he kept beautifully laid glasses and, you know, the cups and the wood set together and spent almost two, three hours enjoying each other's company, pouring that liquid out of the jar into glass and feeding each other. This king was watching from the other side. What the hell is this man doing here? He's with a woman. 
and he claims himself to be a master and not only he is sitting with the woman, now it's all late evening, mm -hmm. God knows what else they are doing. Mm -hmm. They are drinking, so he barges in, what sort of a master are you? He starts cursing him, then he tonight says, forgive me my lord, you are the king. I told you, you are not ready for this. You have too much of a prejudiced mind. He tells the lady, please remove your veil and show who you are. That was his mother. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a beautiful story how mind <coughs> interprets mm. things. You have seen it correctly. Your eyes are beautiful. Yeah, they told you all kinds of things. But your prejudiced mind interprets things the way you are exposed to. So that's where I think many <coughs> other practices, inner practices helps us not to be judgmental. Right. Final conclusion is never good in anything. I think uh, that's a great lesson because, you know, the same, the same example of the eyes, you know, I've always noticed how the French eat their food. You know, I mean, they have a fantastic diet and French are some of the healthiest people in the world in terms of physical, you know, mental, emotional, and they'll have butter, they'll have their croissants every morning, their coffees, all of that stuff. And then I look at the Swiss. I travel very often to Switzerland to meet people and I mm. notice that it's staple in their diet. They have about six to eight pieces of chocolate every day. Mm. It's their culture and not dark chocolate. In fact, in fact, my Swiss friends tell me we made dark chocolate for the world who thinks it's very healthy. So we saw a business option and we make dark chocolate, but we eat milk chocolate mm. and it doesn't impact them. But when I bring that, when I look at India, people are scared to eat one piece of chocolate because they attach that one chocolate with weight gain, diabetes, all the fears which are in the mm. mind. Mm. Okay, and the same issues, the same kind of people, human beings are eating that food in a different way with a different mindset. The French enjoy their food passionately. They don't see food as an enemy. They, they don't see food as fear. And likewise with the Swiss, the way they said chocolate. So sometimes we just tell them, change your perception to the food that you're eating. You can decide whether the food's gonna make you fat, cause diabetes, cause cancer. Or you can decide that that food, even if it's unhealthy, is going to feed you nutrition your body is going to be able to digest it the right way. Mm. And we have these groups of people who start eating guilt-free and changing their perception, adding a little bit of gratitude, even if the food is not that healthy, it could be a samosa. And that group of people, they have no digestive problems, no gas, no acidity. It's just their mindset towards the food <laughs> they're eating. It's so unbelievable. True, so, true. so like in di like in India, diabetes, everyone equates the disease diabetes with sugar. Mm. It's far from sugar. People don't get diabetes because they have sugar. They get diabetes for several reasons. Sedentary lifestyle, overeating, inflammation in the body. And then they look at only sugar levels mm. when they have diabetes. They don't look at the pancreas, which is the organ that produces insulin. Why isn't my organ producing enough of insulin? Mm. So they're focused on parameters on a piece of paper rather than going to the root cause and saying, I have inflammation in my <clears throat> pancreas because I'm acidic. If I reverse that, maybe I'll start producing more insulin mm. or my cells will utilize it the right way. So I love your idea of the whole spectacle kind of a thing. Mm. And medicine, absolutely. I mean, we use pharmacies all the time for medicine. Yeah. But I always say that medicine should be used as a crutch. Use it to get you through, but get it's to the root cause using, you know, your heart, your perfect. mind, make lifestyle changes. Perfect. Basically. perfect. And I love what you wrote in the book, you know, about karma, because that's a question that I really had for you, because I'm in a line where I see patients today, a week later, you know, they've passed on, fourth stage basically, terminally in. A lot of clients, uh, Daji, they keep asking me, is this my karma? They accept. And for me, someone accepting debt, okay, is the end. That is the death sentence. The fact that you accept that my cancer is going to kill me. So at that point, you know, heartfulness comes into a big way into helping them meditate and look within. But at that point, when I'm facing them and I get to a question, when they say, oh, it's my karma, so this is how it's going to be. You know, what, what are your thoughts on the relation of karma to disease? Many people think I've gotten cancer because I did something bad. It's a karma. Mm. I think against that. I mean, not against that. I don't think it's the reason. At this point, you have a disease in your body and we've got to figure out the best way. Mm. But how, do you, how would you explain that to people suffering from disease who accept that this is my karma, so I must suffer? Well, what would you say where millions of Jews were killed in the Hitler camp? Was it the karma of every single human being who was exposed to that torture? Not really. It's an act 
of a brutal man. I'm giving you the extreme example. Right. Diseases. You are eating out of obedience to your wife. Mm -hmm. You don't want to displease her and you go on eating whatever she's making. Now you are not designing your destiny. In a way you are because you are obedient husband. Mm -hmm. But the crux here and what I'm trying to convey that it is not only our karmas, individual karmas that play part. But there are third party influencers also that change the history of human race, that change the individual lifestyle of an individual person in order to compromise and arrive at peace. You may, you, we need to compromise in some way. But going to an extreme of all the time obe ob being obedient in certain situations where someone loves potatoes all the time and you go on cooking potatoes and the whole house is enjoying potatoes fine but what happens with the health ultimately to the whole family it's a consequence of one person's decision in ayurveda the traditional way my father by the way was an ayurveda doctor my mother was not, but she was trained to cook, what not to cook, especially in certain seasons, mm -hmm. what not to feed in the morning, what not to feed at night, what two different foods cannot be combined, you know, on what days you need to fast, what days during the certain seasons when it is raining, what foods to avoid what extra food to give during winter, mm -hmm. what extra drinks to be given, things like lemonade, lemon juice, mosaic juice during summertime, the increased mm -hmm. doses. So a wiser lady of the house who is well trained, who, had, who is exposed to tradition, he did not go to a college. But when you are exposed to the wisdom of the family, wisdom of our elders, wisdom of our grandparents. You know, when this bridge, wisdom bridge is broken, we lose a lot in the process. Mm -hmm. But a lady of the house can, like a vaccine, can prevent many diseases in the house, mm -hmm. house members, by cooking the right stuff. Right. Avoiding the right uh, unnecessary uh, elements creating a routine, not just what food, when is also important, right doses, quantity is also important and with what attitude, let us see if your mother throws food, hey you stupid fool, eat this, mm. neem rice, it's good for your health. Even if she gives you chocolate with anger, yeah. it won't help. So. Attitude also does matter in the whole equation. I'll, I'll share with you one beautiful experiment many, many years back. I don't know which year. Dr. Paolo, he was good at conducting experiments of serious and coming to serious conclusions. But his experiments were all very simple, not million dollar projects, you know, simple experiments. One is very famous, which is a conditioning of a dog selected selective conditioning of a dog, is it? Okay. where he would uh, feed the dog and before feeding dog, he would ring the bell, mm -hmm. right? So he created a kind of a state of mind in the dog, created a reflect action in him. So each time he would ring the bell in future, the dog would come running for food. And as he is running for food, he is salivating and drooping saliva all over see, while running. It's a beautiful experiment. The same uh, Dr. Paolo, he conducted beautiful experiment which is applying today very heavily for us in our discussion on attitude during the time mm -hmm. when we partake of food. Hmm? That experiment was like this. <coughs> he trained the cat. And each time cat consumed food, he would measure the acid secretion in the stomach. Mm -hmm. okay. 
He could see it through the X-ray pattern and oh, it's the juice now in the stomach. Now, once while feeding the cat, just about to feed the cat, right? He brought in the dog, barking, wow, 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 coming and cat witnessed this and she was about to consume the food. With the barking noise, she got so scared. The secretion which was about to start, it, it held up. See? Mm -hmm. So the fear element while eating created a havoc in juice secretion which would have digested the food. Yeah. For hours, the organ remains threatened. Imagine people arguing at dinner table. It affects the Lot digestion. Anger at that yeah. time. Per contra, when you are prayerfully in a meditative way, both are extreme examples I'm citing, mm -hmm. and where there are a lot of fights and anger. It doesn't happen every day. Mm -hmm. And this aspect, where you're eating in a very peaceful way, mm -hmm. where you're not even aware of your peace, you're not even aware of your enjoyment, you are just being yourself in the family, with the family, you are partaking the food together. It's joy when you witness it. So such habits, I think, help us a lot, you see. Nowadays what happens, children poking the phone, watching the TV or cartoons, having their cereals early in the morning, mm -hmm. they watch Looney Tunes early in the morning. Having, why? It's mother's fault actually. Right. So that they don't bother mother early in the morning because she's busy doing whatever. Mm -hmm. You have started a new trend. In order to keep quiet your children, you are adopting a bribery method. Let me show you the cartoons. Mm -hmm. Play with this toy, play with my phone, play with this game while eating so that child would cooperate. But do you see the effects of all this electromagnetic radiation yeah. on, on plants? Have you, have you <laughs> come across one experiment? I think it's very famous. You Google mm -hmm. um, effect of electromagnetic radiations mm -hmm. on growth of plants. Experiment conducted by Denis, uh, school in Denmark by children. They <coughs> exposed this growth of various uh, grains under all same conditions. Uh, so one same condition in the sense, but with, with one variable in each situation. One variable was <coughs> three scenarios rather, or four scenarios. One was with the Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. Plant growth exposed to Wi-Fi. Plant growth exposed to Bluetooth radiation. And plant growth affected in a meditate, meditative environment or where they are doing uh, their traditional worship. And fourth is the control uh, environment. Mm -hmm. They take moong or some, and they allow the sprouts to grow. All four conditions are same. They maintain four conditions the same way, okay. with one variable. And you'll find a, a, amazing results. If, you, if someone is a teacher, they can run this experiment for all children. Let all children participate in that experiment. At home also, it can be done very simply. Take four different saucers and put four different for uh, in its four plates, you mm -hmm. put water, same amount, same amount of grains mm -hmm. in all of them, and expose them to these four conditions, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, normal, and where you do your puja or where you do mm -hmm. your worship. Study it after a week, take the photographs, all of them put together and take a photo and see which one is which. Yeah. Let children do it. So children can participate in this experiment, observe 
and also develop the capacity to decide it for themselves. Mm-hmm. See, I'm worried about something, I'm angry about something, I'm irritated as a consumer of the food. The person who is cooking is also irritated, angry. This goddamn fellow doesn't give me my salary properly and then he throws something on it. Mm-hmm. Give it to the customer. The laborer who are carrying the grains or vegetables, they are also bitter about the whole thing while carrying it. Farmer who is cooking, I mean, who is producing it also, he is worried about his livelihood and he has no choice but to sell it at a low price. You see the chain reaction of emotions carried by the food that we consume today. Mm-hmm. Again, I'm citing extreme scenarios. It doesn't happen every day like this. Maybe one step is better than the other. But everything does affect us. Does that mean I should stop eating? No. There are always the solutions. Mm -hmm. Best is when we become meditative, when we center ourselves, then it is easy to nullify such impacts. Let's say someone who is cooking touches the food with so much of love and care. As if this food is being prepared to serve Lord Jesus Christ Mm -hmm. or to serve Lord Krishna or to serve the deity of the choice or for your beloved. There's so much of love is involved and when that person consumes it, I think it can remove a lot of spiritual defects in you. I agree. I want to add a small story over here as well. You know, so there was this group that realized that whenever whenever they eat, you know, pastries or cookies <coughs> from normal shops and stuff like that, they would put on weight, they would feel unhealthy mm. if they have a normal piece of cake. Whenever they go home to visit their parents, mm. okay, and their mom is baking a cake, you know, like she would do it every weekend and they would have this tea time and have that cake and tea, the things that we avoid today. Mm. You know, the experience of having that homemade cake, which still has sugar and everything in it, the experience around that whole family thing, the memory of your childhood, it's a pleasant experience. Mm. You're eating in that environment and it digests so differently from the food, which is called fast food today, which you just buy a cake, you know, it's processed, highly processed. The job of the person selling it is to sell more. So exactly what you're saying about the environment and the intention behind it are so different. And I'll give you my personal example. When I go back home to Goa, my mom has like a high tea, mm. like, you know, and there'll be cakes and pastries and all of that stuff. And I eat it in that environment without any fear, without any, and it just doesn't impact your body at all. But when you come back to the city, if you try to do that for even one week, you know, you start feeling lethargic and full of sugar and the body's toxic. So I love your point And I want to bring that back to even children today where You know, even I keep telling parents, do not force your children to eat food. You know, Mm -hmm. your moms will be running around, running after their children with a plate, trying to force feed them. I'm like, there's no point. Even if you succeed, the body is not going to digest and absorb. And you're making your child create an aversion Mm -hmm. towards that food. Then they see meal times as a fear time. So they already start making excuses before dinner. I'm not feeling well. My stomach's hurting. So I guess, you know, what you're saying about creating that environment, Mm -hmm. And if we can't create it for people around, at least we can create it for ourselves before our own meals. So true. It's a tricky business. Mother, correct, she has to go to work. Yeah. Child has to be sent to nursery or to kindergarten by some time. He, first of all, is, you know, not waking up in time. You want to force him to get up. Mm-hmm. You want to fa- force him to brush his teeth. You have to force him to take bath, you have to force him to eat quickly so that the bus may not go away. Yeah. Otherwise, you'll have to change your routine. Mm-hmm. Instead of going to work, you'll have to drop the child and then go to work. That creates problem with the boss. Right. The life becomes so full of tension. So what happens? Mothers or fathers, they end up pressurizing the one that can be pressurized, yeah. children force feed them Mm -hmm. or else no cartoons Mm -hmm. no games I will not buy you this or I will not buy you that 
if you eat this, I'll give you that. All bribery right. starts. Yeah. See? And I think it's time to address such matters amongst people in general, the society today. What matters the most? You have finished, you have improved your career, you have risen to a high level, especially mothers. Mm -hmm. But what happens to your children in the process? Yeah. There is nothing wrong with rising, but imagine the price we are paying. Right. I agree with you. I mean, I'm all for women empowerment and, you know, for them having ambition. And uh, but I feel they have to weigh the consequences and the costs at which it comes. And I know there are successful women who can maintain their children and maintain their careers and maintain their health, yes. everything together. And for me, that's success. It's not just becoming a CEO or be becoming an entrepreneur and achieving, you know, a career success at the loss of everything else. And that's not just for women. That's for men at the same time. But, you know, how do you put that balance together, mm. which is why I feel it's important for everyone at some point, man or woman, you know, in that space of meditation to find out what they truly want and why they're doing what they do. So, you know, I look after some of the richest people in the world and when I ask them, you know, what was your intention about building such a big empire? Most of them don't know. And when we go deeper into conversation, because over time these people have become friends, they were like, you know, well, our parents said it's successful if you make so much of money and you have this designation. So they equated success as a child to getting that managing director designation, no matter what, even if they're unhappy or, un you know, happy about it. So I really think it starts at a level like you're saying, you know, I mean, if we don't know why we're doing what we're doing, mm -hmm. you know, we follow, we follow what the world is showing us that success is defined by your designation. Success is de defined by the kind of car you drive or, you know, the houses you have or how many exotic holidays you can do in a year. And that's not an issue. But as long as you can balance success, like you said, without losing out on the children, like I have, I have parents who bring their children to me with eating disorders and the only disorder is how it's going to be fixed is the mother should feed the child, not three servants. Mm. You know, the mother has to be there and that's the only issue that has to be fixed. And they're bringing fancy tests from the US and saying, oh, there's an allergy, is there intolerance? I said, there's, there's really nothing wrong. That bonding of food between the mother, that's why they breastfeed that initial bond. If it doesn't happen, there are enough of case studies showing how a child sep you know, faces anxiety separation. If they're not fed, a mother dies at birth and you know, the child is not immediately breastfed. So that connection gets broken the moment they stop breastfeeding and a, a nanny or a servant starts feeding the child. And I'm not yeah. saying that this is, you know, it's happening a lot. And I feel these are little things that have to change in order to, you know, put the whole holistic healthcare model into place. Some approach is required. It's right. not an impossible problem to solve. Yeah. Problem can be solved. We have to pay a price. Hmm. For every solution, there is a price to be paid. And everyone has to pay that, yes. right? Yep. For some reason. I like to bring in to your attention for so that you can tell all your patients you know, in Sanskrit there is a beautiful terminology swastya means generally it is taken as health true in one sense when you consider health as an overall phenomena of harmony between body mind and soul okay when mind is compromised, it is one sort of trait. Eh? When body is compromised, because it's not healing for because whatever reasons, it has its own traits. But both, especially the bodily ones, yeah, you can, to a large extent, Remove it through the modern medications that we are having. Mental thing, it's a challenge. <clears throat> okay. The root behind the mental problems, as you say, karma. But then many other things <coughs> also play a part in this whole equation. It's not individual karma from the past. I have the ability to change my destiny. Though my destiny today is governed, let us see, 60% by my karmas or by my samskaras. 
but I still have greater amount of freedom to change my destiny as well. If I am allergic to certain food, is it because of my karma? Perhaps. Even if it is, what do you, what are you going to do about it? Mm-hmm. See, there are ways uh, and means how to improve our reaction to the food that we take, behavior that we have. One behavioral thing that impacts a disease which immediately shows up people having psoriasis mm-hmm. when they are depressed, when they are angry, mm-hmm. when they are irritable, it flares up. You know, in this uh, skin disease, mm-hmm. uh, psoriasis, it flares up because of such changes in the, at a mental level. Yeah. In turn, psoriasis and lung disease are also correlated. I have seen over the years of <coughs> observing myself, okay, when I am angry, when I am irritated, when I am grateful, when I am extremely in a state of extreme state of meditation, when I'm so absorbed and when you observe the breathing pattern all this time, Mm -hmm. it's so beautiful. You can mark the differences. When you're angry, you can see your breath is gone haywire. Per contra, when you're in extreme state of meditativeness, it is different. When you are in such a state all the time, imagine what happens to this breathing problem. What happens to the psoriasis, they subside very fast. Mm -hmm. Allergic reaction to external things subsides very quickly. There are many good studies done recently. Uh, Papers are not published as yet because this research is still going on. But we have Mm -hmm. found so far, heartfulness meditation with transmission has reduced greatly over 40%. Extent to which one would have nausea after chemo. Mm-hmm. Nausea is a vomiting is the number one complaint Correct. after yeah. chemo. But if person is exposed to heartfulness, relaxation, and meditation with transmission, it changes everything. Yeah, we've seen that, and we've not seen it. The oncologists have told us that and the Can patients you, who meditate, huh? they walk out happy. They come in with energy. That even the other patients are like, you know, how come they're not suffering? Is yeah. their question about that? We've already seen that. That's amazing. So, yeah. since you have mentioned the idea that they are having such a dreadful uh, disease, right? Yeah. And yet, they are not troubled. Mm. They have accepted. Acceptance is the key. Yeah. And when you when you accept what you are going through, okay, fine. Now let me do what I can do. Right. Whatever is in my hands. First thing would that would be really good to help ourselves to go deeper within ourselves, Mm -hmm. to center ourselves. Swastya actually means that. Swa means the self and Astya to stay. Stay within the self. Now, to whom are you considering as the self? Is your body the self? Is your mind the self? Or your causal body which is the Mm -hmm. soul that is the self? If you remain focused on the body and say, oh, I have feeling this, I am feeling that, good. We need to take care of that part. Mm -hmm. But by focusing on the periphery of the system, you are only increasing the imbalance. Mm -hmm. You think of this thing as an entire system, as a will, the center as the soul, in the middle there is a subtle body, the periphery as the our manifested body. If you pay too much attention to the periphery, the whole will will go wobble. Hmm. But if you pay attention to the center and increase the force at the center of your attention, then it doesn't matter what happens around the rim, you are settled in the center. To such a person, you know, I have seen it 
or in many people in this organization, especially when they meditate, they may be suffering because of whatever situation, final situation, emotional situation. We all go through all these things, family problems, right? right? The crisis can haunt you. They are always haunting us, mm-hmm. health-wise also. But person who is settled within because of who he is and that person has become who he is by his daily routine of things that he has embraced in his life, meditation mm-hmm. or no meditation. Mm-hmm. But with meditation, you become more center focused. Mm-hmm. You are settled in yourself, Swastya. Peripheral differences, peripheral storm will not affect you. Right. So meditation does prepare us in a, in a smart way. But meditating on a problem mm-hmm. can destabilize oneself. Meditating on a good thing is different. Meditating on a problem will only make it worse. Just like where you put your attention Medi- it grows. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to go back one point because it brings up a question that, you know, brings up a scenario that I experience all the time. You know, I've realized, <clears throat> you know, nutrition you know, people get on diets, there are fat diets, there are fat exercise programs, you know, everything is extremes in today's world, you know, ketogenic diets and all of these things. People have moved away from simplicity. Okay, I always compare, you know, I always look at the life of farmers. Okay, I look at farmers working in the field. I have spoken to so many of them. The women are slender, tall, healthy, robust, except for the ones who are sick, of course. The men are ripped. They don't go to gyms, they don't drink protein shakes, their food is minimal, carb-based, what grows they eat. I mean, that's nature showing you, you don't need to read a magazine written by a doctor or nutritionist saying Mm. that this protein will build your body. It's clear, it's, Mm. you know, it's a product sale or you're enhancing a diet. Mm. So there are fads that exist in the world. I'm noticing that spirituality today is also becoming a fad in a way. The people are making it a fad. It's not a fad. So people jump from one chanting class to another, one meditation class to another, and yet they seem more unsettled than ever before. Mm. So what I see is that what they've learned in their meditation, they fail to apply. They don't learn to apply it in like, so if I've learned to meditate in this morning today and my intention for the day is not to react but to respond, it's great, it's an intention. But the moment I get into a situation, it's I'm different. reacting, I'm not responding. Yeah. So I feel that, you know, people have a to-do list and meditation done, exercise done, organic shopping done. They're just following a list, but they're not applying, they're not able to apply it. Now, people who are sick, they get the opportunity to apply it because they realize that, okay, my chemo cycle, my chemo cycle's coming up. I'm going to visualize and I'm going to meditate and do it differently today. How, how can we, how do you see us bridging this gap and getting people to start applying? Is it routine? Is it discipline? Is there a technique that, you know, we can get people to really apply so that they get the true benefit of this in their lifetime? You know, whether it's spirituality, whether it's nutrition. <laughs> I find, I mean, let's imagine the scenario, okay, the day you come home early, Mm-hmm. from work and say, I'm going to go to sleep early. Moment I hit the bed, I must be gone. Mm-hmm. When you desire the most, it runs away. <laughs> you try your best, oh, I want to sleep early. It doesn't happen. People who meditate also, they say, oh, today I'm going to go off. The moment I close my eyes, I must be at a super, super, super consciousness state of Samadhi. It doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. More you chase, faster it runs away from you. Mm-hmm. You have to relax all your efforts first. Okay. Okay. Second thing, do you have interest? Mm-hmm. It's even more crucial than the first one. If you have the interest, then you don't need will to use willpower. True. Huh? Yeah. You don't have to struggle. You don't have to put alarm clock. Interest creates everything. On your first day, did you have to put alarm? Hmm. Which is your girlfriend? She's waiting at this time. You didn't have to put alarm clock. 
to a child, do you say, my dear child, use your willpower and have your ice cream? Mm. Doesn't have to use willpower. Mm. When you have interest, everything happens beautifully. Are you interested in your health? Okay, if you're interested, you have this. Mm. But the problem is that, but I don't like to meditate. I'm interested in my health, but I don't like to meditate. What do I do? I'm interested in my health, but I will not take chemo. Mm. I'm interested in my health, but I will not go see this doctor. I'm interested in my health, but I will not take these foods. I'm happy with whatever I'm eating. Well, if you have this attitude, not even God can help you. I see. And you write beautifully in your book about intention. I'm a firm believer of intention. You know, you either start your day off with the right intentions, no intention or the wrong intention, and your day flows that way. So, uh, what would you have to say about intention, setting intentions when it comes to healing or prevention or just living a good life or feeling good about yourself? <clears throat> when, it, we have, when we have to make use of intentions mm-hmm. as far as health is concerned, to think oneself as healthy is good. To think oneself to be better than yesterday is good. And looking forward positively that, yes, I can cross this river. I can do it. This positive feeling helps. Per contra, you think, oh my God, I can't do this. I will not do this. It's impossible. It's not for me. Right from the beginning, you have denied the change that can happen in you. We have a choice. Either you <clears throat> say, I'm not going to do it because I can't do it and I don't like this. Versus, oh, I can make a difference to my health. I will do this. This seems interesting. Let me try this at least. Give an <clears throat> advantage to your doubt. Okay, may not be, I may not like um, to do this, may not be capable of doing this. But let me try. Maybe let me see what happens. Right. Instead of eating bread, let me eat this. See, if this food habit which is prescribed to me is helpful. There is nothing wrong as far as it is mm-hmm. going to improve my health. And you are not talking to a street person who says eat this and eat that. You are talking to a professional. Right. But often there is a topsy-turvy thing. And here in Vertendo, it is so sad. When a restaurant person who wants to promote a particular dish to his advantage, because if it stays in the restaurant for another two hours, it will get spoiled. Mm-hmm. People get mesmerized by their, oh, a lovely dish, please we have this. It's the special recipe of the day. Mm-hmm. Versus a person who says, oh, this prescription for food is there. My doctor, who is my nutritionist, has prescribed these foods. But people, they they take it with so much of uh, pessimism, Mm -hmm. so much of doubts, but they surrender to the waiter in the restaurant. Mm -hmm. It's a tragedy, you see. Mm -hmm. Once you, you are paying a fee to a doctor, you are paying a fee to a therapist, Have a trust, have a faith, Mm -hmm. you know. It's only food. It's not going to kill you. It's not uh, something of uh, of a poison-like thing. It's worth trying. It's only food. How can it harm you? Mm. Right? Secondly, meditation. How can it harm you either? Mm. In the worst scenario, you have wasted 10 minutes of your time. Every day. Do you worry about 10 minutes of the time when you read some crazy magazine or go through uh, some unnecessary FaceTime or mm-hmm. Facebook or Twitter. Mm. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Anyway, I think this discussion can go on and on and on. And 
<laughs> have like hundreds of mm-hmm. points that I'd love to just talk to you about. But no, it's amazing. Can I ask you one last thing? Just discuss one last thing. So when it comes to discipline, because, you know, today, I mean, I've been through all phases of my life where my parents instill discipline and they, you know, they said discipline is the way forward. Of course, at that point, we had no choice but to listen to them. And as we, you know, we rebelled against it, like any child will do. But today, I'm doing a full circle in life when I'm, where I'm coming back to discipline and routine. Mm. And I have, you know, I work with some of the soldiers in the veteran program in the U.S. who have come back with, you know, disturbance in their mind and, you know, depression. And all of them say that all the new programs, which has robbed the armies of discipline. Before everything was discipline, you have a problem, deal with it over, move on. Today, it's like there'll be a counselor who'll get into the problem. And like you said, where you put your focus, it only grows. So that emotional, you know, distress grows more and more. Finally, where, you know, the system is not complete. They come back or they're shipped back because they're depressed. And then some of them create crime. Some of them commit suicide and all of these things. And they only say that if it went back to what it was, which means discipline and routine, we wouldn't have been in this whole post-war trauma situations and stuff like that. So what's your take? Because it's something that's really close in my heart to start getting people to instill okay. discipline again in their lives and in their kids. I, I think you are. <laughs> you have not asked me one question. You have put a million questions in this. <laughs> no, um, discipline and routine when it comes to meditation. <clears throat> so when you gave me the example of what veterans, war mm. veterans, it's a very sad situation. Yeah. Uh, my heart goes out for them. But one thing for sure, you know, we're raising wars to create peace. Mm. One last war to end all the wars. It doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. Mm. Right. <clears throat> to create a discipline, one has to see what is at the end of the process. Carrot has to be given. Mm-hmm. Right? One boy came to me many years back. It was 2013. <clears throat> he was not interested in studies at all. Mm-hmm. He said, I'm fed up of my studies. I don't want to study and I give up. I'm fed up. Parents were crying. So emotional. You know. And he had to clear the 12th exams, right? Parents were pressurizing, you must get 90 plus. We don't have money to pay for private colleges. Mm -hmm. Competition is also governed by this class of students and that class of students and economically back. So the government also doesn't support certain, if you have a certain surname. Mm -hmm. If you have a certain surname, but economically your father may be a millionaire, but you will need to lower percentage, you'll get the admission. It's a mm-hmm. tricky situation in India. Children are under tension because of all, all these things. But anyway, to cut the story short, what motivated him after our discussion was this. I, I asked him, forget your study part at the moment. Tell me, which car do you like? Mm-hmm. He said, oh, I love Fiat. Mm-hmm. I said, Fiat of India or Italy? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I like a sports car from mm-hmm. Italy, Fiat, mm-hmm. okay. <clears throat> which is to him better than BMW and Mercedes. I said, great. How much does it cost, my boy? He said, it's about three and a half crores. Mm-hmm. I said, great. Stop studying, great. How did you get three and a half crores to get the car? He started thinking, see. I say, if you drop studies, you will not be in a position to even buy a bicycle. Mm. Today's world, if you need a job, if you find a job, first of all, you need a good education. Mm. Otherwise, you'll be surrounded by beautiful Fiat's and Mercedes and BMWs, Mm -hmm. but you'll be a driver there. That woke him up a little bit and glad he is right now clearing his IIT. Wow. See? <clears throat> Students, discipline, a person who is following a spiritual path, 
discipline. discipline. A guy who is going to a gym, discipline. Everywhere, discipline is, is necessary. Today I go to a gym and say, okay, I'm going to the gym, but I will skip lifting weights. Mm. A successful uh, bodybuilder, is, you know, he's able to move from 5 kg to 50 kg in short time. If he doesn't, if, he, if you don't succumb, if you don't rather accept this resistance, the challenge, then muscles are not working. They will not build. Moment you say, okay, 10 kg today, 2, 2 kg tomorrow, 1 kg, half kg, and no mm -hmm. kg, your muscles will Correct. You know, they will deteriorate over a period of time. They are not challenged. Mm -hmm. So discipline is, is a challenge. <clears throat> okay. But when we see the result or outcome of it, when you do it with joy, mm -hmm. Then the blow of discipline is not there because now you see the end result. Imagine a yogi, day after day he meditates, but the carrot that he is dreaming to acquire is not there. Mm -hmm. Good meditation means how well you have gone deeper in yourself, how well you have forgotten yourself, mm -hmm. how well you have remembered the Lord or have got absorbed in the Lord. If these things are lacking, if day after day, your experience is deteriorating, then why would you meditate? At every process in this world, you need a carrot. First see the carrot and let that move you. Mm -hmm. Later on, the reaction changes, protocols change. Later on, you do it not to acquire anything. Uh, any younger days when the romance is there, oh, I love her, oh, I love her. Mm -hmm. I love her too. There is no end to this nonsense. Later on, when you settle with the person you truly love, you stop looking around. Mm -hmm. And a higher stage also comes in, you are loving for the sake of love because this one person has trained you now to love everything. That's why heartfulness recommends family life. That where the, your efforts are challenged, your emotions are challenged, mm -hmm. everything about you and your love is challenged. Yeah. Then we learn slowly, oh, now it is love for the sake of love, not for individuals, not for any. Mm -hmm. things or objects or any fulfillment, emotional or spiritual. Love for the sake of love. Then you don't need discipline. You mm -hmm. arrived home. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you thank so you. much. It's been an honor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.